Well done, Charette. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. There's a lot of hard work, evidently, that's gone into the making of this film. And um, I know we've talked about it before, but actually without even talking, for me, there are a lot of kind of evocations, inscriptions, a lot of things going on there that resonate with even with me. Um, the power of nature, the create, the destroy, the colonial ruins, the little details of the of the fan, which suggests that sense of tropicalesque, you know, the paradise, so called, that colonial, post colonial kind of signs and symbolism going on, the absent presence. It's so layered. Um, I'm even even seeing it again. I've seen it before. There are things I'm seeing again that I didn't see before that register. You know, the little yeah. lace touches and and also the style in which you've made it. It's it's, it's slow. It's silent, and um, it doesn't follow a linear narrative. But there is a narrative there. And so, kind of beginning this kind of conversation, I suppose. Do you want to talk about? your own, why you made it, I suppose, in, in the context of your own cultural background and your practice? Well, my, and the film is still a work in progress, by the way, um, so we, you know, we, we've reached a certain point in the residency of Oliver. Um, I, my work kind of explores identity, and it has done for many years, and the, the kind of social politics that, and histories that go around forming identities, and um, I've spent a number of years in London working on various projects, exploring various diasporas. Um, and I had, in a way, this project had always been there. Um, I think for a lot of us who come from different spaces or, or different, different, different parts of the world, there's always, um, there's always a, a story that, that perhaps we want to tell. And I guess, it, I suppose we started working on this project about three years ago. We kind of felt that the right time to start to explore this and bring this language out. The Indian Ocean territories aren't something that it have been explored hugely in contemporary art. Um, and there are lots of interesting points in which these spaces have perhaps started to become understood as being pivotal to other histories in the Americas and, and elsewhere. Um, and that actually, you know, the, the s ironically, the same, the same processes that the same processes of, of, of lots of colonial spaces took place in exactly the same way. Um, and it's those overlaps of people that this film has tried to explore. It's almost an introduction to the language of these places and um, an introduction to, the film tries to reference perhaps little pivotal moments in those different races, communities, in starting to understand how or where they have settled today. Okay. Do you want to give a sense of that kind of that kind of history in a sense and that colonial that colonial past? Yes, I mean what what makes Mauritius interesting is because it never it has it never had any indigenous people of its own. So the the Dutch were the first to settle it and they didn't do too great a job of that. They they abandoned it after about eighty years. And and almost a century later the French took over and they they probably they probably put the, the biggest identity stamp on the country um, in the Napoleonic Wars it was it, it was taken by the British and um, and British knowing how to run estates businesses they they didn't mess with it they left it as it was so the language remained um, and um, and so Mauritius started you know became has has been led in an interesting way because of that um, that history. The the French brought a lot of slaves. Um, I think at one time there was over eighty thousand being brought to Mauritius. And you have to understand Mauritius is the size of London, so it's a tiny it's a tiny country. Um, and and then in the post abolition period, almost immediately there was mass um, immigration of indentured labourers from India. So similar to the Caribbean. Um, in that way. And, I mean, in terms of that kind of colonial period, and you talk about the kind of, there was the Code Noir yes. introduced by the, uh, the Napo during Napoleon era. Um, uh, and then later on, you had the indentured laborers, the Indian indentured laborers. How did that kind of work out in terms of relationships in that transition from 
from slavery, post emancipation, and post yeah. slavery. I, I guess for, I mean from from what I from what I've understood is that I mean the the system, although indentured labour system was was almost a legalised version of of, um, of slavery, or, or you know, a, a very slightly altered, but um, but there are fundamental dynamics I think, and one of those is that sort of under 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 slavery you had the you had the colonial family system. Um, you have the head of the household, the plantation owner, and there are certain dynamics around how those the psychology of those relationships plays out. Um, but essentially, I, I guess, is that slaves weren't allowed to form family structures, they weren't allowed to keep their children, they weren't allowed to marry, whereas indentured laborers often came from the same villages, the same communities, and they were allowed those, those, um, um, those practices. So all, all sort of almost straight away, there are two very different ways that those, the, the, the people are going to be able to, to find their way. And there's also, you had under the Code Noir, you know, lots, there were a lot of people who won their freedom, the Noir Libre. And I think there was probably, there was probably uh, um, a gap, you know, between the, those, those, th that community and the newly freed slave community post-abolition. And there was definitely no homogeny amongst that group of people. Um, and almost immediately you had the Indian indentured laborers came in. And there are, th I, I, I guess the, the, the prevailing theory right now is that, that the, the slaves didn't get a chance to get a foothold, you know, in the post-abolition period. Um, and they couldn't find, um, they couldn't find sort of power relations with others within who, who, who had also found their freedom perhaps, you know, up to a century before. So, so there's, yeah, there's quite some big, big differences in there. And is that create kind of tensions within this social setup, this colonial context? I couldn't say if there's tensions, mm -hmm. but certainly there is today in certain ways, and it, and it probably exists in the language. Okay. And with other kind of um, setups where you had African slaves, there were maroon people who escaped. Yes. So in Mauritius, was there a kind of situation there with maroon arms? Yeah, it was known as the maroon... Um, Maroon Island, mm -hmm. and because of the vast number of Maroons, Maroons are escaped slaves, and there is an area in the, the south of the island called Le Morn, um, a mountain peninsula that sticks out, sort of pointing towards Africa, towards South Africa, and there there has been a large number of skeletons found at the base of the mountain, and the there's an old story that says that there was a community of Maroon slaves that lived on the cliff face of that mountain. And the, the after abolition, the British sent um, a regiment of soldiers to go and tell these guys that they were free. Um, but believing it was the opposite, they threw themselves to their death. Um, and it, it's become a UNESCO site. But there's there's a lot of theory that, the, that actually when these guys escaped and the eventual realization that Mauritius was an island, because they perhaps didn't have that perception of of anything outside of Africa, and they might not even realise that they had they had departed from that from that space. But certainly, when they perhaps realised that there was no getting off this island, that there was a symbolic throwing yourself towards that towards Africa. And you told me a story from one of the French colonial uh, elite. I think that relates to the passage near the end. Yes, of right. Yes, yes. So you see the fact you do see the Mourne Mountain in uh, the latter part of the film, and you hear a guy reading from the diary of Bernardin Saint Pierre, who was a French Enlightenment who visited Mauritius a couple of times. And um, excuse me, he um, he goes on to write a book called Paul and Virginia, which describes um, it's it's a naturalist book. So so the the colonialists are living at one with nature. They're kind of born into the bosom of nature. They live at one with their slaves. You know, everybody is, it, it's a kind of paradise island as he describes, but actually his diary describes almost the complete opposite of his experiences as you can imagine. And the part, that part that the, the reader speaks, and the reader is actually the owner of that plantation house. Um, he, he describes meeting 
a group of maroon hunters along the road one day and with them is a young black woman and she looks very sullen and they ask her what they ask them what's wrong and they tell her to open the bag that's on her back and it's the head the head of her lover they suspect because they've caught them and they've they've killed her her lover and bringing the head back was the proof and he describes that the paradise island disappears and this island of abomination appears before him um and so there are there are interesting dualities the creole community the descendants of, 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 the, of, um, of the slaves in Mauritius, their identity is very much bound together with that of the white Mauritians, the, the Francos, uh, the French plantation owners. Um, even today, even though they are at polar ends of the society, their histories are probably more tightly bound together than any other group of people on the island. And that is simply because they, they cannot trace the, Fre the, the French don't want to trace their roots back beyond Mauritius because they say that they are the true, they are the true Mauritians. They are the founders of the island. Um, and the Creoles, well, they can't. There is no history beyond, beyond that for them. So those two are very, th it, there's an interesting duality there that, that exists. And so you have this kind of imagined histories, which is a feature of yes. colonialism, post-colonialism. Yes. You, yeah. you can really do kind of reconstruct the kind of myths that we want to kind of say where they come from. And what you've just described is so kind of resonates with me, a kind of Caribbean situation of who you aspire to be yes. in that kind of colonial experience. But talking on the sound, we just talked about language. Yeah. There are a number of moments where in terms of that, the sound landscape, you know, from the sound of the sea, the footsteps in the forest, um, the children playing in the yard, um, the voices of Gandhi, yeah. the radio broadcasts, the triumphalist independence radio broadcasts, even the kind of video shock of independence in 68. And then something quite profound right at the end that comes after that broadcast is the sound of the drumming. Yes, and the Ravan drums. And the whispering, that yeah. sounds like a prayer, juxtaposed against these images of these kind of Catholic saints. It's almost like a ritual taking place. Yeah. Um, do you want to say something about well, that? Well, the, the, the whispering is actually um, a part taken from the Book of Genesis, which is used in the Code Noir. So the Code Noir is the system that governs how um, um, slave owners and their slaves, what kind of relationships they can hold and how the whole system needs to be worked out. It's actually written by the um, French Crown uh, before Napoleon. And in there, they... they you know, the, the, the French crown is under pressure to find some kind of theological reasoning to the system of slavery because, you know, the, the, the king is the head of the church, he's the, he's the direct hand of God, or, you know, so, so th there, there has to be something that links back to Catholicism and to justify it. And so they use an, e an extract from the book of Genesis, which is the story of Ham, where Ham sees his father Noah naked, and so his father says, right, you are going to be punished and your punishment is to be the slave of your brothers and your children will become the slave of your brothers. So it, it plays into this, the, there, there were two, there were two area, um, schools of thinking, um, polygenic and monogenic um, ideas around um, explaining slavery. And, and the, this version of it says, basically says that um, blacks were the descendants of Ham. And so therefore you have to accept your situation and in the afterlife, you might receive redemption. The other theory is that we have all been degenerating since Adam and Eve, but blacks particularly. So, there's th th but these are some of the reasonings. And, and so, you know, there was, you know, so then the missionaries come and there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of emphasis for becoming Catholic within those uh, amongst the slaves. And then obviously that carries on into post-emancipation. And, and today, that is probably the biggest homogenizing factor of that that particular group of people, the Creoles. Um, and again, there's a, there's a very twisted inner that exists because obviously that was used to justify their reality. Mm. And within that, at some point, they had Gandhi's voice who made a, an intervention. Yes, so the Indians, yeah, I mean, the Indians also suffered a lot under the system, but there was, a, th there's, like I described before, there's different dynamics as to why the, that, that group of people um, perhaps were able to, to uh, move away 
from poverty in a sense um, faster. And and I guess because they they came from the same communities, the same backgrounds, they were able to keep their family structures. They're actually able to do things like save and create create credit unions amongst themselves, and that allowed them to buy land. Um, in in actual fact, the villages have been created in exactly the same way that villages were created here. You know, people were eventually able to to create enough enough wealth to be able to buy little sections of land from from the bigger states and so you know little villages um, crop up in between and Gandhi was interested as you know as he did as he sent a lot of people all over the place interested in the, in the realities of indentured labor around around the world and um, he eventually came to Mauritius gave a speech a speech which unfortunately sadly is not recorded anywhere it's a very impromptu little speech that he gave to a small group of people one morning um, in which he tells them, as he did a lot of places, that the Indians needed to educate themselves and needed to become politically aware, awaken themselves. And so, in, in a sense, that's, that's what happened. And, um, and yes, the, the Hindus uh, dominate the politics today. Mm. And what complicates it for us is, is the language, because in the language you can hear Udu prop, possibly, but right at the end, over the drama, there's a sense of Creole. Yes, the Creole thing. language, yeah. So the Creole is a French patois. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, it's, it's funny because in lots of ways, various groups in Mauritius want to distance themselves from having anything to do with Creole or being partly Creole. Um, and yet the Creole language is, 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 is one of the greatest unifying things. It is, it is the language of the country. And the Sega music that comes from that language which, were, which developed from an oral tradition um, of storytelling by the slaves and the maroon slaves. And that later developed into the Sega music um, and then was sort of discovered in the 50s and became the, um, the music of the country. And Chifreya is the li little brother, is the voice that you hear singing, who was, who was the archetypal Sega singer. It's called mm -hmm. Sega Kipik. I mean, there's so much more. I could, I could talk about the banyan tree and the entanglement yes. of the, the branches and the roots kind of almost strangling. I mean, it's a recurring motif, actually. Yes, I mean, that site is actually a, a political hotspot right now because the mountain has become a spiritual focus for that community. And there is a battle to try and regain the rights of access to the mountain. The mountain is owned by a mysterious individual who doesn't allow access, all, all these kinds of things play out. But, um, but those banyan trees at the base was actually a, a little village where in post-emancipation the, the maroons and the freed slaves gathered, gathered in and around that region and started to live and the Sega, those, those trees were where parties would take place and the Sega music and the narratives would be retold. Mm. Um, and then there's the domestic interiors. Yes made up bed and the kind of the, the, the front room and again there we, we were kind of exploring some of the, the these are these are old French merchant houses um, which have then been taken over by um, Muslim traders that moved into Mauritius in the middle of the 19th century and in, in, in this in the second house that we see where we, we hear the, the, the sound of independence um, it, it, it's interesting because there's there's this part of it wasn't just the Hindus, but the Muslims as well. You know, very much involved in seeking independence and um, and those discussions of politics, the forming of labour parties. All these things took place in the in the domestic space. And although there's this yearning to get away, get out from under empire, everything that you see in the houses, the, the order, the lace, the way the tables are dressed, the furniture, these are all things that have been based upon the values that have been learnt through that process, through mm -hmm. through that period. So again, there's, there's, there's other dualities of, of that identity of the aspirations, but what the aspirations are based upon or where the aspirations have come from as well. And in this kind of complex situation, how did you find yourself in terms of then making the film, the code film? How did that work? Um, I, I mean, I've, I've been researching it for quite a long time, quite a couple of years, and there were, there were times when I, when I visited and I found it difficult to move around the country because I would, uh, you know, you, you, you're reading some of the, as, as, as one um, writer describes, the kind of the pornography of violence, which I, I, I really wanted to, to get away from. I mean, this film isn't about slavery. This film is about 
identities in them and what are the what are some of the building blocks that have created um, the space that they are and um, so yeah there, there, there have been difficult times but I think I, I also managed to put a lot of it to, 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 to bed as well mm. yeah I, I, sorry I, because one of the one of the things that, that you you know if you're, you're exploring different communities you have to you have to go and talk to all kinds of communities and obviously some of the best ways to do that is to make friends within those communities and um, and I spent a lot of time with the, the Franco Mauritians the, the white Mauritians and and heard their versions of, of, of their perspective of of their position within the society and it is complex for them as well it's, it's a difficult identity to carry um, there is I wouldn't say there's guilt but there is th you know th there's certainly a, a, an understanding an understanding of how they're perceived and also a feeling of the, you know this wasn't me this isn't th you know th these are not my actions and yet I still have to carry a certain amount of of, of this within within my within within who I am and um, so yeah and in terms of identity in terms of that Mauritian diaspora as it were I mean you said you closed some things off because you were born in Mauritius and you're coming back and have family there how has that been in making the process of making it that journey what is that now like now for you where now come finish it now what have you learned what have you um it's it's a, it's a it's a difficult question, but I certainly I wouldn't have been able to to get to some of the places without knowing some of the people I knew, without understanding some of the without understanding some of the communities in the first place, and knowing perhaps where to where to look for it. What's interesting is that I had to go to I had to work with different historians from different from different racial backgrounds in order to try and shed enough light from different perspectives to see enough because otherwise you you do you do get a very mm. you don't get there actually and history is such a mature part of the process i mean you said it's a work in progress because you've also talked about where you've also gone elsewhere you want to say something about the future now in terms uh, of development yes i mean um, the the next stage of, of the project we are exploring a story in madagascar i say we one well, my producer jess um, we uh, uh, a story called uh, a book general history of piracy some of you may have heard of um, and within that there is a story of um, a, an early literary account of non-partisan democracy in a pirate kingdom off the west coast of Madagascar and there again you know you, you start to be able to explore interesting ideas around sovereignty freedom um, collective identities and uh, general history of piracy was written by supposedly Daniel Defoe. Daniel Defoe. Yeah, go and read it. Robinson Crusoe. Read it. So <laughs> <coughs> okay. Um, I mean, I suppose we can return back to the what was the what was you you begin with the ocean? Yes. And you finish with the ocean, and you finish with the ruins, the colonial ruins. You finish actually with the cemetery. Yes. Um, I suppose. I mean. Wherever you are in, 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 on an island, you are always aware of the ocean, especially an island that's only 20 miles across. And there, there's, there's always this constant feeling that, especially when you visit some of these ruins, that you know these, these, these very polemic, these grand histories that in the end disappear into nothing. Yes. And that you know the ocean is really the real owner of all of this history, of all of these spaces, and that we're almost, it's almost borrowed time, borrowed space. I think that's a good note to uh, <laughs> Are you happy? Yes. Good. So I think we can open the floor out to <laughs> any kind of questions or comments or things that we haven't maybe possibly picked up on. Subscribe to Amen Money. I mean, we're doing all 
Well, ironically, food is, is actually the one thing that Mauritians are the most proud to be, to, 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 to come together on. And, um, and it, it is, I mean, I mean I, I'm Mauritian, I'll, I would say it, but Manic would probably say it as well, but it is it's probably one of, the, one of the best cuisines around because it is, it is a combination of European and, and Asian. And it has all the layers of, of, of Indian and African. And everybody has ownership of it. There isn't one group of people that feels that this is lent more to this group or that these guys did more or, or that everybody buys into it. Even, even, even the Franco-Mauritians, you know, I was asking one guy who was um, quite, quite a wealthy guy, he, I asked him, you know, how do you, how do you cook your deer? Because they have, they have, you know, lots of deer um, on the, on, you know, obviously yeah. wherever the French go. And um, they, he said, in a masala with a curry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you might expect something completely different, but food is, is, is the one thing that people really do come together on. Um, and there's probably some interesting questions to add around that one as well. Mm. Um, I just wanted to ask you about your visual language, your visual art of sculpture and painting. Um, it's, all, it's, very, it's very strong in these times of new, new cuisine to sort of more recent ones. Mm. Well, the when 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 I first decided that that I that I uh, that I felt this that I needed to make this film was the film is part of a bigger project of of a series of installations and paintings. Um, that's it, that that's its intended destination to to not just be shown on its own. And in a way, I felt like I needed an introduction to some of these ideas, and I needed something that was overarching <coughs> and being. Actually, being in my grandmother's house, which is one of the scenes you see where you see all the plant plots in the, in the yard and you kind of scan through them, I was sat there and I was taking some photographs and the movement of the light and the leaves, you know, it, 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 it's classic filmmaker stuff, but I just felt that there needed to be time within these images. There needed to be, it needed to be time-based and it couldn't just be static. And that, you know, I've tried to compose them to a certain degree as I would um, with paintings and perhaps there needs to be more time in the film, perhaps with, with some of those spaces to be able to draw some of that out. Um, but yes, it, it's, it's, it's very much come from, 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 from being a painter. And those, um, those compositions have very much come from that. In terms of, of the choice of language, um, the f I've, I've tried to give space to, to different groups of people. I've tried to give them space, uh, enough space to be able to describe um, the environment in which they launch in and the overlaps, the overlaps of, of, of those different communities, how they've come together to form, to form these, these, these new identities uh, or these hybrids. And, um, and so the mechanisms that I have to hand are things like colour and texture to be able to bring those those objects into the fore in the architecture. Do you have a lady there? Yeah. Um, I was just going to say that um, my family is from Mauritius yeah. as well, I don't see it often in there, and I was just very interested to see how you um, represented different cultures within that society, and also the kind of, um, I suppose the, the Similarities and the differences between them, because as you just said, the food, everyone seems to define just like the one uniform cuisine, cuisine. Yeah. and yet um, my experience is um, that when you look at the, um, I say the Indian 
I'd been born in London and having heard that it's a piece of crime and this is our parents were so proud. We only sort of got one perspective. Mm. Going to Richard and seeing it and being part of the culture for a little while, you get to see sort of different layers and how things are often very polarised. Yeah. And also that there is you know, there is this I, I was just very pleased to see how you represented it within the film. I didn't want this to be a documentary and although there are lots of I, I decided to I, I influenced by a lot of filmmakers who are around right now and a lot of those guys are much more subtle in I think in, in, in certainly in their soundscapes in, in where necessarily these places are um, or what they're alluding to and I didn't want to be that subtle I wanted to be more direct um, about what the symbolisms were and what are perhaps some of the, um, the catalysts and some of the histories of these different groups of people or communities. Um, so, for example, using the passage from the book of Genesis, which is the crux of the code noir. Um, and, and that seemed enough. And, then, you know, and the la language is quite important as well. I, to have, I had individuals reading from those communities those passages. Because although we might not necessarily notice it, but there are very subtle differences in their accents and the way they talk, slightly more African, slightly more French, slightly more Indian. And, um, and that's it's quite <coughs> important, the narrative of the language through it. Because in a way, the language is, 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 what, is what describes, th that describes the status quo today, the Creole language of these spaces. I mean, you find it even in the way that people describe each other from the Creole language, you know, it is it is a particularly racist language. I mean, we would find it really difficult here to to if we had direct translations to hear about how people describe each other. Um, these conversations haven't happened in Norfolk, and I, you know, and I and I believe haven't happened in a lot of yeah, these yeah, these ex-colonial yeah. spaces. Yeah. Um, and in, and in a way, that's what makes them quite important places to to re-examine um, colonial history. And what that means to the people who are there now and also what that means to us here um, as well. Okay, good. Thank you very much. This is an ongoing conversation. Yes. Ongoing work. Ongoing work, yes. We look forward to, to the next chapters. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.